O Lord, give me the tongue of the learned, that I may know what I ought to say. And if there be any word good for the use of edifying, give it, that thou mayest minister grace unto the hearers. Grant that I may speak boldly. I have put my mouth wide, O Lord, do thou fill it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ has loved us, and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This morning in our continuation of the, uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, we get two therefores. Now, anytime Paul uses therefore, he is building on a previous thought. The previous thought is this. As Christians, we have put on a new self. The old one has been put to death, and the new one is created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The first therefore Paul uses today is, Therefore, since you have put away all falsehood, behave this way. Our lives should be different than that of the unsaved world around us. We should have at the warm, gooey center of our hearts Christ who animates us. And this should cause us to be different than the world around us. Paul demonstrates this by giving them some examples. And we can read it as just that, a list of ways that a Christian should behave now that they are in Christ and not in the world. Do this and don't do that. Here's a couple of examples of what this looks like. Don't lie, don't be angry, don't steal, don't curse. In short, here are the Ten Commandments. Do them, and you are living the Christian life. However, as I was reading this, I noticed that it also reads as a road map for how to see the world in the new light of Christ. Paul begins, Since we have put off falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And I ask my question then, so who then is my neighbor? It's the same question that is posed to Jesus in Luke's gospel by a lawyer, an expert of the law, who, who asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answers, well, what is written in the, in the law? How do you read it? The lawyer then answers essentially the summary of the law that we just said at the beginning of Mass. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, as your, and your neighbor is yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus says. Do this and you will live. But this was not sufficient for him. Simply telling him how uh, to live the Ten Commandments left him with so many questions. He's an expert in the law, but he needs more in his understanding how to properly live in eternity. So he asked Jesus the question, who then is my neighbor? The same question we find, in our, we find ourselves asking when Paul left, leaves us in the same predicament. Here are the Ten Commandments, do them and live. And Jesus' answer gives us both gives us both the clue as to how to live in these commandments by by telling the lawyer the parable of the good samaritan after which he asked the lawyer so which of these three do you think proved the proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers to which the lawyer said the one who showed him mercy It's now in this light that we pick up, we pick back up Paul's advice. Let each of you speak truth, speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of, of, of another. It does no good to tell our neighbor anything but the truth in love. What good would it accomplish if we told, if we told them, if we have told those who have fallen amongst robbers and lay half dead in need of someone to show mercy to them what they want to hear. What good does it 
do to leave them beaten and dying and essentially walk by them in such a way as to give them reason to remain in death? Is it not better instead to give them the words of life and to attempt to bind up their wounds? Paul continues, be not be angry and do not sin. Going down the same route, be angry that the world is currently in such a state that there exist those who are lying wounded and in danger of death. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, he says. Do not wait for someone else to take pity on them and bind them up. Use that anger and give the devil no quarter. Do not let him ha have leave to steal any longer, for they are not his. Instead, Paul says, let him labor, or let him toil with his own hands so that he may give me that he may have something to impart with the one who has need do not leave the dying man to the devil instead bind him up tend to his wounds place him on your own donkey and, and bring him to the place of his refreshment this is the opposite of telling them what they want to hear that they may remain in death it is learning the need, learning the hurt that we may bind up the wound. This requires one getting one's hands dirty and toiling in the muck to be able to creatively participate with Christ in the fashioning of a human being. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And this toil that we are called to is not time to spout our own thoughts on any given subject, but to breathe life into this monk and to allow God to then give them life. For we cannot save anyone on our own apart from God. Sure, we can we can bind them up and send them on their way, but this would actually be doing them a disservice. Seeing the hurts of the world and fixing them by ourselves is a good thing. But doing it apart from God does nothing to actually heal them. Jesus tells the disciples when they complain when a woman anoints him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, they say, why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum of money and given to the poor. Jesus replies, Why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she is preparing me for burial. Fixing the world with only that which is available to the world is not a long-term fix. There will always be more pe poor people, Jesus tells us. There will always be more people dying because ultimately the world is destined to die. Worldly solutions cannot solve heavenly problems. They are good for what they are, but they don't ultimately help much. So rather than just binding up the wounds, we are to breathe the life of God into them. Paul gives Timothy advice on how to do this very thing in his second letter to, to him. It says, preach the word, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebu rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. This is why we must, we must breathe the breath of life of the life of God into them as we bind up their various wounds. Because if we tell them what they want to hear by feeding them the lies of this world, then they will simply move on from this one place of their ailment to the next place. Rather, we are not only to bind them up 
but then we are to place them on our own mule and bring them to the Father, who is the place of their true healing. And finally, Paul says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. I looked this up in the, in the Greek. It says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. That word there is lupeo to experience deep emotional pain, sadness, a, a severe sorrow. It is a very intense and hence even uh, a very intense uh, feeling and it, hence it is even used of the pain of childbirth as in Genesis 3.16. So he's saying here, do not cause the Holy Spirit sadness by robbing him of giving birth to another human being. Only the Holy Spirit gives birth to human beings. Anyone can give birth to a person. Only the Holy Spirit gives birth to human beings as Jesus defines it. That is, those who, like Christ, have become fully alive. To grieve the Holy Spirit in this case would be to fail to bring them to the Father so that he can give them life. Then... We come to Paul's second, therefore. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Because we have been born into Christ and have put away all falsehood, imitate Christ and love the world as he does. He died so that we may have life. And in gratitude for that life given to us, we bring all the world to that life. We see the world as neighbors in need of mercy and then go forth in Christ and bind up their hurts and bring them to the Father. That way they too may receive life. And this is how we are to live into the Ten Commandments. Not as thou shalt not. But because we have been born into Christ, thou shalt now do this. We live in the commandments of God by showing mercy to our neighbor and putting that, and putting that which is not of God to death in our own lives so that we may be conduits of God's love in the world. We are to go out into the world understanding that we are to act as if the world is already a part of the body of Christ and behave as such so that they too may realize the love of God and live into the body as well. What Paul is doing today is giving us, through the Ephesians, a glimpse into the mission of the church and then giving us the guiding principle that allows us to proceed in confidence. He says, be imitators of God as beloved, as beloved children. That is, participate in his creation of humanity by bringing those you encounter to him. Walk in love as Christ has loved us and gave up himself for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Christ came to give himself as a sacrifice for our redemption. Walk in this same love and give yourself to him and aid him as he, as he creates human beings, born in the Holy Spirit of all that are brought to him. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.